Blockchain and distributed ledger technologies enable people to interact in a peer-to-peer -peer way without going through a trusted intermediary. This innovation makes it possible for us as a society to organize collective governance in exciting new ways. But it also poses challenges to our existing governance frameworks. I had a chance to sit down today with Vitalik Buterin, the inventor of Ethereum, to delve into this topic. When you first started Ethereum, what, what was the philosophy with which you started it? So you, you set out to build something, you wanted to do something that was Turing complete because yeah. you wanted to be able to, to build this sort of world general computer, purpose blockchain, general, general purpose blockchain, yeah. um, instead of something that was limited to yeah. just a certain set of transactions like Bitcoin. Yes. So for people who don't know what Web3 is. Web3 is this uh, vision that you know Ethereum plus a combination of several other technologies can bring about a more kind of decentralized internet that puts basically more control in the hands of the user. Mm -hmm. And this is a suite of technologies that includes Ethereum as a kind of decentralized database, Whisper as kind of decentralized messaging, Swarm as decentralized content hosting, possibly other technologies as well. And these things will be you know, developed in some ways together, but designed to be nicely complementary with each other. And you could see a lot of applications using some combination of both. Uh, what about the infrastructure environment, hardware requirements and things? Um, well, one of the things I uh, actually love about blockchains is that they can survive without needing much special hardware. Mm -hmm. So like, I uh, personally just actually really love the idea that basically the thing could just run on a few thousand guys with their regular laptops. That's one of the things that really excited me about Bitcoin early on. It doesn't require all of this like billion dollars of capital started up by people who are already here before and that would be basically impossible for a new group to match. It's just, you know, like a few thousand people on their laptops is all that you need. With respect to hardware, what about people who are not going to have laptops but just yeah. smart devices? Look, one of the things that we kind of deeply cared about from the start, especially for people with laptops, is a very strong light client technology. So this basically means that you, know, you can use this technology to have a client that runs on a phone which has almost the same levels of security and trustlessness as a regular client, except it's going to look vastly more efficient. And you can do that uh, in, in Sudan. Um, where yeah. you have people with you know, you know, pretty probably basic phones not, Su and... not Sudan now, but probably Sudan in three to five years, yes. Like people do underestimate, I think, just like the sheer level of mobile penetration and right. you know, like how quickly it's uh, growing. Mm -hmm. I think uh, once all of these places have uh, internet access and once they get up to, like basically once the quality of $20, $20 phones increases by another couple of, a couple of years worth of time, it'll definitely be at that point. So you think you genuinely think that Ethereum is going to be a worldwide penetrating technology, uh, that, and that we're not going to be limited by bandwidth and hardware? That's uh, definitely what we hope. I mean, like if we, were, uh, if uh, blockchains were only usable by the rich, then the whole space would definitely be much less interesting. So how are you thinking about the incentive structures that you're no. building in, um, particularly with the upcoming? Transfer, transition to Casper sure. proof of stake. Um, there's a lot of skepticism, as I'm sure yes. you know, that uh, there's just going to be this massive centralization around mm -hmm. people who already have huge stakes yes. being able to control the network. Obviously, this is not something that surprises you right. and that you're planning for. Uh, I mean, it's definitely kind of another sort of devil you know argument because like with proof of work, you know, you notice that 70% 70, 70 of mining is done out of China, 70% of mining is uh, done using mining hardware created by one company and run by basically like five or ten guys. Mm -hmm. And like the thing with hardware centralization is that it's the sort of thing that is uh, in some ways much harder to dislodge, right? So like in right. Casper, for example, there's a mechanic where if uh, like uh, even if like a group of people that have you know like, more than a third of the deposits collude and and they uh, do an attack, then basically the mechanism penalizes them, and once the attack is detected, it takes away their money, right. and so they don't have the money to do the second attack anymore. But with uh, hardware, you can't really do that. Like you can't like there's no way to kind of burn a piece of hardware from inside a protocol. From my kind of point of view of someone who has like really deeply thought about these protocols, I think that proof of stake kind of is better on a bunch of dimensions. Um, and like the kind of meta argument that I, uh, that I uh, use to explain this is basically that because proof of stake has to do with virtual assets that are defined inside the system, it means that you have more, a lot more freedom in basically de determining rules that are optimal. Mm -hmm. And so we can design systems that you know, like in general have much better incentives, like better structured rewards, and you know, like larger penalties for misbehavior and so forth. Mm -hmm. Whereas with proof of work, you're kind of stuck with the laws of physics in some ways. Well, there's also this transition plan in place, right? So yeah. we're combining proof of work and proof of stake exactly. for, for a certain period of time. Yeah. And 
you're doing you're doing analytics on that right. to see exactly. what's happening as it evolves. Yeah. Obviously, you can you can pull back if you need to. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a pretty technical topic. So for for CG viewers who don't really know that much about the details of how, let's talk about a different internal governance aspect, which is how decisions about changes to the protocol are made. Currently, in Bitcoin is done through through mining, essentially, right? Because the miners decide which version to accept. Mm -hmm. um, there are different mechanisms in different chains. We saw, you know, Tezos launch earlier this mm -hmm. year, or ICO anyway, yeah. <laughs> with um, with the idea of building a different kind of a governance mm -hmm. system or decision making system yeah. about protocol changes. There are several other uh, protocols working on different models, and some people say, hey, everybody who uses the system should get to have a democratic say right. in protocol changes. But reality is. Most people are not developers. They don't yeah. know the details enough to be able to really have an informed opinion about mm -hmm. stuff. And yeah. it's just like in, in our societies where we have rational ignorance about a lot of things mm -hmm. and people don't want to invest their time in trying to figure yeah. out what they want to vote on in this kind of an internal governance scheme. How do you think about this problem? Who should be able to decide? Governance ultimately is like basically the set of kind of institutions and norms and agreements and kind of standards, you know, like what economists call shelling points around like basically under what contexts should people use these underlying tools and in what ways. In you know, like the physical world, you know, you would have like parliaments and constitutions and laws and so forth. And you would have uh, also on top of that often very informal norms about like, like the ways in which different things should be used. Social um, norms. Yeah, exactly. And um, in the crypto world, I think you like, basically you have like, some of the same thing, right? So you have at the very bottom level, you know, like people's ability to write software, miners' ability to mine on particular chains. Um, and at the higher levels, you would have developers discussing between themselves, so developers implementing software, um, developers like you coming up with mechanisms between themselves to agree on like basically what the software changes should make, you know, like what block they should activate at, under what conditions they should be agreed on. And you would know, have users ultimately always have the ability to basically just rebel and refuse to accept a particular update. And then on top of that, you would also have norms and expectations about what kinds of updates should happen in general. So for example, in Bitcoin, people really cherish the 21 million limit. You know, there's also the ideas of decentralization. There's the idea that this thing is supposed to be a currency, like you're not supposed to arbitrarily take money away from people. So basically, if a user finds something distasteful and there is a norm against it, then the user knows that a lot of other people find it distasteful as well. And they also know that because there exists this kind of you know like meta level social object called a norm, there you know, like other users will also be more interested in coordinating around basically not accepting the update, and so users are going to rebel, and not install a software, and you have things like Ethereum Classic. Sure, and there are a lot of there are a lot of really well known and well documented sort of human rationality errors. Yes, totally. Um, so I mean, all kinds of biases. If you just go to the wiki page for cognitive biases, yep. you there's, get this list there's of a like bunch, yeah. sixty now, and, and yep. including mm -hmm. things like uh, we've. Changed change the way that we remember information because of the Google effect that yep. we, we tend not yep. to even bother to remember things that we can easily look up on Google nowadays. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. the way that we interact with technology is actually changing our human thinking biases as well. Yes. How do you plan for those and design those in? This is one of the reasons why like, the economics of crypto economics is so interesting because like some people say that you know like oh crypto like crypto economics is not going to work because people are not fully rational or people are not purely motivated by economic factors but what people don't see i think is that even though like, economic incentives are not the only thing that motivates people they are a very large thing that motivates people yeah but there's a difference between motivating people with economic incentives right. and being able to understand how they will behave in reaction totally. to that incentive yeah. because sometimes people could take completely irrational strategies yes right but practically speaking like the idea is that it's easier to predict the idea that people are more likely to take things that will make them more money than it is to predict that any specific bias is going to be very stable and robust across decades across decades and across different cultures and across like being like the actors being people versus we're organizations versus robots. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of probably one factor. And another factor that people miss is that it's not just about incentivizing people. It's also about this idea that basically, like, if you try to break Casper, then you lose a lot of money. Right. And so even if you're an irrational actor, if you have some particular amount of money, well, you can only do so much. There's a mathematical proof of an upper bound on like the ratio between basically how much harm you can cause and how much money you can burn in order to achieve it. Right. And so like using basically like economics as just a way of measuring actors in terms of the resources that they control is also just an, kind of another aspect of this. 
there are a couple of things that that have been sort of major topics of conversation around you in the last year, right. last month or so, a couple of months. Um, one of them is about you know how much involvement should founders and core mm -hmm. devs have yeah. in going around and evangelizing blockchain right. versus actually working on the protocol. Um, doing things like meeting with world leaders, mm -hmm. you got a, you caught a lot of flack for for your trip to Russia, yes. for example. Uh -huh. um, why do you do those things? How do you make decisions uh -huh. about how to balance your time? Yeah, you know, I think it's definitely first of all def worth it to reach out and talk to people because uh, first of all, like it helps people understand that you know this is something that's concrete that's. Uh, got actual people behind it and it's got um it's got legs it's got potential you know we're we're here to help humanity mm -hmm. um and i think uh, you know like that just getting the understanding of that and just what the technology is and how it works is valuable and have you, also, have you I gotten think the sense uh, that people have understood that when you go to talk to, to I think world so. leaders i think that we're so. here to help yeah. Human humanity yeah i mean i think like they uh, have been definitely quite friendly in general over the last few years. And it's also important, I think, for us to understand them, right? And basically to understand, you know, what are the challenges that kind of, you know, basically mainstream institutions currently face and what role can the technology have in addressing them? And, mm -hmm. you know, like some of the uh, conversations I've had, uh, and probably more, this is more with banks than with, than with governments, mm -hmm. but you know, like, to some extent with everyone around, you know, like, what are the privacy challenges? Why are they uh, interested in consortium chains? You know, like, what, are they, what is their thinking about scalability? I think that's definitely like, all fairly important. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, like it, I, some of it definitely does end up kind of informing things that we focus on. What are the things from your perspective uh, in interfacing with the law, with mm -hmm. governments, with regulators that are hindrances? to what you're trying to achieve? Um, I would say the main kind of regulatory thing that's been a hindrance in practice just is like difficulty of cryptocurrency exchange. Like, aside from cryptocurrency, so far there hasn't really been much hindrance to uh, blockchain technology as a whole. But you know, like, at the same time, public blockchains, is, despite being usable for a large number of things other than cryptocurrency, still fundamentally rely on cryptocurrency for transaction fees, economic incentivization, and a lot of other things. It would be so much better if people could buy like $100 of cryptocurrency instead of $0 of cryptocurrency. But and yet, in many places, it's still like going from 0 to 100 is much harder than going from 100 to 5,000. Right. There's big differences between how politically easy it is to you know like go after a technology where 90% of it is being used by terrorists Absolutely. versus you know like going after <laughs> a technology by... where you know like going after something that's like the internet where you know like yes terrorists use it but also the people who catch terrorists use it as well and you have you in your sort of looking at different parts of the ecosystem around the world are there certain areas that you parts of the world that seem particularly friendly or particularly um, hostile to ethereum as an idea or as a project or as mm. a decentralized uh, model of organizing society basically the thing uh, that you need that i think like a lot of people and probably even a lot of libertarians even more than average uh, like underappreciate is that very few people hate freedom like basically <laughs> the and, you know, like very few people hate privacy very few people hate right. decentralization right. but you know, there are a lot of people that finds those like find all of these things slightly valuable but not too valuable and you know like they just come up with a thousand exceptions for a thousand different cases why oh in this particular case I want to have more control yeah there definitely are places that have more uh, that have more of that than other places so you know like on the one hand you know like China has had like the ICO ban and uh, the ban on, uh, on most uh, crypto trading right. but on the other hand you know like there's uh, uh, a lot of other places that you know like Switzerland you know like Singapore that that uh, have shown themselves to be very friendly. At the end of the day, people, nobody hates freedom and nobody hates yes, privacy. Exactly. But a lot of people dislike uncertainty. Yes, totally. <laughs> yeah. And and government is one form of certainty. Yes. Sort of the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. Definitely. Especially with a centralized mechanism like that, even just to handle visas throughput, let alone every imaginable smart contract, that's not going to work if everyone's running a copy of every com program on their computer. Yeah, totally. So, you know, if you look at like uh, just the raw numbers of blockchains today, Bitcoin is currently processing some a, a bit less than three transactions a second, and if it goes close to four, then it's uh, already at peak capacity. Ethereum, right? You know, over the last few days, it's been doing about five a second, and if it goes above six, then it's also at peak capacity. 
So on the other hand, you know, Uber on average 12 rides a second, PayPal several hundred, Visa several thousand, major stock exchanges tens of thousands, and if you want to go up to IoT, then you're talking hundreds of thousands. And if you're, you want to go up to non-financial applications, so like for example, there's a platform called Leroy, which is basically just Twitter on the blockchain, then you know, you're talking also about hundreds of thousands, possibly millions. So, you know, there is a kind of gap from here to there. And I think right now there already is really a lot of institutional hype in the space and just public hype. So when you have, you know, like Vladimir Putin having, you know, knowing what blockchains and Ethereum are and Paris Hilton going out promoting ICOs on Twitter, you know, that's, that, that's peak hype. But the reason, I think a large part of the reason why a lot of this hasn't materialized into action yet is precisely because of some of these technical obstacles that make blockchains, you know, work okay for some niche use cases, but not really work, work well for mainstream use. Now, you know, our team is working very hard on various kinds of scalability solutions. So you hear about buzzwords like plasma, sharding, state channels, write-in, you know, all uh, there's you know, various newer ones like Perun. Um, so, you know, if you, you know, you, all of these are various different ideas that actually do try to kind of break through this fundamental barrier, right? That try to either create blockchains that still maintain a large amount of security without requiring everyone to literally process everything, right? So if you think about it, like one extreme is one guy processes everything, which is today's world. The other extreme is everyone processes everything. Well, what if you can get like square root of everyone? So like maybe 500 people processing each transaction, you still get enough decentralization and security for everything you need, but suddenly it's, you know, with, within, uh, it's efficient enough that you know it actually works for for stuff in the real world, and the the other kinds of strategies are strategies that try to use the blockchain in a uh, kind of more intelligently, right? So it's basically, you, like one of the analogies that like Joseph Poon from like uh, Plasma uses a lot is um, the uh, um, idea of the blockchain as a court system, right? So blockchains are great at securely resolving disputes, and. You know, currently, the way well, well, like the naive blockchain applications work is they just put every single transaction on the blockchain. But what you could do instead is you could have systems where people send messages um, that I call kind of tickets, so digitally signed messages that are off-chain by default, but where the blockchain only gets used in those specific cases where there's a disagreement. So like if I have 100 digital, you know, like 100 Ether, and I send you the 100 Ether, then that, then that might not ever go off chain. But if I send you the 100 Ether, and then you claim that I never sent you the money, that, or I claim that I never sent you the money, then that's an, a transaction that I could, okay, we have a dispute, and I could actually push it down onto the blockchain, and so we still have, you know, a guarantee of security. Now, all of these approaches have their own trade-offs, and there's this huge amount of incremental technical work involved in figuring out what the right trade-offs are. But you know, this starts looking like a direction that's much more promising. And how far along are we? How, how long until you think that uh, maybe we can scale to, uh, as you said, hundreds of concurrent users? How many until we can replace Visa? How many until we can replace AWS? I mean, for th things like Visa, I think uh, definitely, uh, I'll say a couple of years. So maybe one year when we start seeing like prototypes that have, you know, like a low security level, but are still, you know, secure enough for like major organizations to start just doing proof of concepts on. And a couple more years for all these solutions to really hit the mainstream. For, I mean, AWS is a trickier one because like there are reasons why blockchains are, you know, no matter how good they are, never going to completely replace uh, centralized cloud computing. And probably even more, one of the big ones, well, there's probably two big ones in my opinion. One big one is that there are computations that are intensive and that are hard to parallelize. So decentralized clouds are really good at parallelization because, you know, it's like Uber for your laptop. You know, you got, you got millions of computers from, you know, millions of countries, millions of providers, all ranging all from individual laptops to, you know, you can, you can think of, you know, even cloud computing companies be, basically turning into like specialized mining farms inside of the system. But if you have uh, computations that require like a really large amount of serial computation, then that's harder to decentralize. And the second really tough one is privacy, right? Like if you have computations on private data, then there's basically two approaches. 
One of them is to make sure the computations are only done on hardware that you trust. And the second one is to use fancy cryptography. So you, know, you might have heard of buzzwords like homomorphic encryption and distinguishability obfuscation to do the computations. But, the, or, but then if you do that, then those tends to carry very serious um, computational efficiency trade-offs. So basically for private or serial applications, you're going to do them locally? Yeah, like in general, I think like, there's, obviously, there's always going to be this large set of applications where decentralized approaches like, actually don't right. work that, that well, and that's sense. fine. Yeah.